Episode 116 Who is this blind man? I called you five times. Why didn't you answer? Kathy walked in front of Alex as she asked her question in a daze. What do you want to say? Alex looked at her. She was acting like a lunatic. He didn't want anything to do with her anymore. Alex, I was wrong. It was my fault before. After I split from you, I found out that I couldn't leave you. You're the only one who treats me so well without asking for anything in return. Let's start over again, okay? She pleaded, looking into his eyes. She wasn't lying to him. After the treatment she had received from Billy and Simon Phillips, she now truly understood how good Alex had been to her. It also helped her that she now knew that he was from a wealthy family. Impossible. He didn't feel anything for her anymore, and he didn't know if she had other motives. He looked at Russell and said, Give her $15,000. No, I don't want your money. Believe me, I'm serious. I'll treat you well. I'm willing to be with you for the rest of your life, she said excitedly. She missed Alex, who had doted on her and treated her like she was a treasure. Kathy, don't be silly. Take the money and leave. Don't interfere with my store's business any longer. He pressed the money into her hand. That's not what I want. She threw the stack of bills onto the ground, grabbed his hand and held it to her cheek. Alex, did you forget that I'm your Kathy? Don't you remember our time together? You dated me for almost a year and I didn't even let you touch my face. Now that I've let you touch me, can you forgive me? Let's start over. We'll be very happy together. She held his hand so tightly that he couldn't pull it out of her grip. Let go! How long are you going to keep causing trouble? He pulled his hand with all his might, causing her to stagger forward. Why? We used to be such a great couple. You even said that you would protect me forever. Even if I made a huge mistake and hurt you, you said you wouldn't blame me and would always treat me well. She desperately wanted to save their past relationship. All right, since you want to know why, I'll tell you right now. It's because you are my first love. I didn't know what love was before we fell in love. So when we were together, I just gave it my all. I ended up in a world with only you. And I didn't ask myself if this was real love or not. After we split up, I met Debbie. When Debbie and I were together, it was so different when I was with her. She would think about me and care for me. When she wasn't there, my heart felt empty. Being with her felt like happiness. It didn't feel like a burden. So I started to ask myself if what you and I had together was really love. I think it was just me being a poor loser and wanting to feel some accomplishment. Now that I think about it, it's quite funny. But I don't think we should have any regrets. We all make mistakes when we're young. Alex reflected openly. Kathy was stunned. His words were a death sentence to her hope of rekindling their relationship. Alex would never take her back. So, if I hadn't broken up with you back then, when you met Debbie and Kelly Phillips, would you have left me? She asked quietly. This was what she most wanted to know. He felt pity while he looked at her. He knew that if she had not broken up with him, he would have remained with her, even if he had met Debbie, Kelly, or any other woman who was better than Kathy. Even if he had realized that being with her had been a mistake. But if he were to tell Kathy this now, her heart would probably be in a worse state. I think so, Alex said lightly while looking at her. He chose to answer her in a way that wouldn't hurt her feelings so much. Her eyes welled up in tears. The tears started to slide down her cheek, but she didn't make a sound. She was trying her best not to fall apart in front of him. Alex wanted to walk toward her and comfort her, but it would be too easy for that to lead to something else, so he kept the pain in his heart. Kathy moved sluggishly. She didn't look at him. She turned and slowly walked away. Watching her disappear around the corner, he let out a light sigh. He thought that from that day forward, this woman, whom he had shared so many experiences with, must have finally ended her feelings for him. You guys carry on with your business. The $15,000 will be split between your bonuses for this month. Alex picked up the money off the ground, handed it to Russell, and left. 
Half an hour had passed by the time Alex returned to the night market. He stood at the intersection and looked at the bustling crowd. He wondered if Rose and Susan had already left, so he took out his phone to call Susan and ask. Rose and Susan were still strolling through the night market. Rose was still unhappy with Alex's previous behavior. <laughs> he really pissed me off. Susan, you saw it too. He was so calm and didn't feel ashamed at all. He seems to think he's worthy of me. Have you ever seen such a shameless person? Rose asked. Rose had been saying those words over and over again all evening. Susan was tired of hearing them. Rose, stop thinking about it so much. Alex has a quiet personality. It's not like you don't know that. Plus, he already has a girlfriend, and their relationship looks pretty good. Don't make wild guesses, Susan said. Alex had not told anyone about Debbie's disappearance because no one would be able to help her anyway. He has a girlfriend, but he's still so shameless. He's so disgusting. No matter what Alex did, he was still a scumbag in Rose's mind. Also, didn't you say Joe asked him to come here and watch over us? Where is he now? When you go back, tell Joe that this guy has no sense of responsibility, so we should stop hanging out with him. Maybe he can't find us because we moved ahead in such a hurry, Susan said. But she also felt that when Rose had been angry, he had run away instead of comforting her with a few nice words. Wasn't that what he did to make Rose hate him right now? Ouch! As the two girls were walking, they didn't bother to pay attention to where they were going. Rose bumped into a man who was lying on the ground. You almost knocked me over, Rose shouted anxiously. She was only a small woman, so it didn't take much to knock her over. Rose, don't you see that he's... Oh my, let's quickly help him up. Only after hearing Susan start to explain did Rose realize that the man that she had bumped into was blind. She stopped feeling angry and followed Susan to help the blind man stand up while handing him his walking cane. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Rose and Susan hurriedly apologized to the blind man. It's fine, the blind man said while fumbling with his cane. Have you got a sore throat? Rose asked with a puzzled expression as his voice was hoarse. She thought the man looked familiar, but his face was obscured by his wide-brimmed hat and sunglasses. I'll be going now. The blind man grasped his cane and was about to walk forward, but with so many people in the night market, he was sure to crash into someone else. Wait a moment. Rose pulled the blind man aside and looked at Susan. How about we help him walk out of the market? Look at the crowd. It's definitely not going to be easy for him to get through all these people. Hmm, I think so too. Susan looked at the man. How did a blind man get in here? Wouldn't this be hard for you and cause trouble for the people around you? She thought. We'll go with you. Rose and Susan each held one of his arms as they walked him out of the night market. He thanked them in a soft voice. He told them that he had come with a friend in a car that was parked by the side of the road, so they walked him to that location. The car was a Mercedes CLK limousine. As the two girls watched in amazement, he mumbled that he had his friend's car keys and proceeded to unlock the doors. Ladies, please go sit in the car for a moment and rest. Thank you for walking out with me, he said politely to the pair. Fine, but I don't see your friends around. Susan and I will be quite worried if you're here alone. Rose had been walking for so long that she was getting a little tired and wanted to rest. Susan, let's sit down for a bit. Rose opened the back door and pulled her into the car. She saw that the blind man was still waiting outside. She said to him, you come in the car with us for a while. The blind man simply nodded at her. Susan's phone rang. It was Alex. Hey, Susan, where are you? Why can't I find you? He asked. Where have you been? We've been walking around the night market. Why haven't we seen you? Susan was also a bit unhappy with Alex, and he knew that he was at fault. I'm sorry, I had a problem. Where are you guys now? I'll go look for you, he offered. Rose snatched Susan's phone away from her. Why are you following me? We don't need you. Just go, Rose said loudly. Joe told me to watch over you two. Where are you? Don't let anything happen to you, he said. You're expecting something to happen to us, aren't you? 
Why would anything happen? Even if something happens to you, nothing is going to happen to us, Rose said sarcastically. I'm not insulting you. I'm, I'm just saying that if, if something happens... Alex tried to reason with her. Now let me tell you, even if something really did happen to me, it would be none of your business. Please don't bother me again, okay? She said. That's what you want, he sighed. You tell me, what's wrong? She asked. While Rose was on the phone with Alex, the blind man had quietly slipped into the driver's seat. Why are you... Susan saw the blind man insert the key into the ignition. Hey, you're not blind, she exclaimed. Susan tried her door and discovered it was locked. The blind man turned his head to look at her. You only realized it now? He said with an evil smile as he took off his hat and sunglasses. Lucille Brennan! Rose screamed loudly. The person sitting in the driver's seat turned out to be Lucille, who had previously harmed her family. What's happening? Alex's excited voice came over the phone. Ha! Huh. Lucille snatched the phone from Rose's hand and cut the call. He turned to look at the girls and gave them a sinister smile. Episode 117, It's a Dead End <laughs> Rose, do you still remember me? Lucille gave her an evil look. What do you want? Open the door. Rose frowned and tried her best to open the door, but it was locked. Rose believed that William Chase, the president of the New York Merchant Union, had helped her family solve a problem brought on by Lucille's family. This gave Rose a lot of confidence and fueled her strong attitude toward Lucille. Smack! Lucille slapped her in the face. He grabbed her chin, gritted his teeth, and said fiercely, Now you're pretending in front of me? Who do you think you are? Even if I throw you into the Hudson River, what can you do about it? He shook her fiercely. He twisted her neck to try to get away, which caused a trickle of blood to flow out from the corner of her mouth. Rose! Susan embraced her with a worried look. She had the awful feeling that he was going to do something bad to them. Aren't you afraid that William Chase will cause trouble for your family? Rose was already scared, but she couldn't act too cowardly now. Otherwise, he would get even cockier, which would cause some more problems for them. Rose only wanted to use the mention of President Chase to scare Lucille away. Huh, <laughs> Lucille snorted. He looked at her casually. It seems like your family doesn't get along that well with William Chase. Oh, wh what do you mean? Rose asked in surprise. He shook his head and laughed. Even though his family had already apologized to Rose's family, William Chase did not let them go. During that time, Chase had put a lot of pressure on one of their corporations, causing them enormous problems. Chase had misunderstood Ken Stokes' meaning and had also attacked Rose's family's business. Seeing that their own decline could not be reversed, Donald Brennan, Lucille's father, made a prompt decision. He decided to withdraw the assets of the family business from New York and seek a new base elsewhere. Lucille laughed because he and his father had guessed that it was a coincidence that William Chase had saved Rose's family. Now, seeing Rose, it seemed like she didn't know anything about the situation when her family was attacked by William Chase. If Rose's family was so close to William Chase, wouldn't he tell them about such an important matter? This meant that their guess was correct. Why are you laughing? Rose was puzzled. Why did it feel like it was a joke when she mentioned William Chase? Cut the crap. Even if William Chase showed up here, what is there to be afraid of? Even though Lucille said this, he was still afraid of him. But his father had already decided to leave New York. So how could the head of the New York's merchant union still do anything to them? Give me back my phone. I'll call my dad right now and ask him to find Mr. Chase to seal your accounts. Rose still had not figured out the situation. Lucille slapped her again. He showed no mercy at all. She was being beaten until she fell back on her seat. Susan hurriedly helped her up. Stupid girl, speak one more time and I'll kill you right now. Lucille scolded her harshly. 
This time Rose didn't dare say a word. Susan also felt a great sense of danger. She felt like she was destined to die. Huff! Seeing that Rose had become humble, Lucille revealed a proud smile. His eyes didn't hide anything as he looked at them a few times. Then he turned around and started his car. Hey, hello, Rose? Alex said loudly into the phone, but it was already beeping with busy signal. Lucille. Alex couldn't help but frown. If Rose and Susan fell into Lucille's hands, the consequences would be unimaginable. He went to the surveillance room that watched over the night market and asked to see their surveillance footage. When the people on duty heard that his friends had gone missing, they played the footage from when the incident occurred. Alex saw the whole picture. He was shocked to see that the blind man who Rose and Susan had helped was the same person he had collided with earlier. This was obviously what Lucille had planned. It became clear that his motive for doing this wasn't simple. If Alex didn't rescue them as soon as possible, the result would be extremely bad. Realizing the urgency of the situation, Alex came out of the surveillance room and called Ken Stokes. Ken was the most effective and quickest way to deal with the situation. Alex, you don't have to be so anxious. I'll call Donald Brennan right now. He definitely won't dare touch your friends, Ken said, which helped calm Alex. All right. Since Ken had said so, it meant that it wasn't going to be a big problem. You would definitely be able to resolve it properly. Alex calmed down a bit, and he hung up the phone. Less than ten minutes later, Ken called him back. Sir, I couldn't get through to Donald Brennan's phone, but I found out that he wants to transfer all his assets to other places. Last time, we used William Chase of the New York Merchant Union to warn him, and from the looks of it, his actions during that period of time were very abnormal. It's very likely that he's venting his anger and taking revenge out on Rose before he leaves New York, Ken said as his tone became heavier. Are you in New York now? I'll go to your place. Hearing Ken's uncertainty, Alex felt a pang in his heart, so he wanted to meet with him. After all, Joe had asked him to take care of Susan and Rose that evening. Yes, I'll send someone to pick you up right now. I'll do my best to search for the location of your friends, said Ken. Twenty minutes later, a black Maserati Levant stopped in front of Alex. He got in and went to meet Ken. At the same time, Lucille had already arrived at a small hotel on the outskirts of New York City. Lucille stopped the car, got out, opened the door, and pulled Rose out. He tied her wrists with a rope, and then pulled out Susan. He also tied her wrists and slammed the door shut. The owner of the hotel was a familiar face to his family. He had already greeted them. So even if others saw him, who would dare to interfere? Get in. Lucille pushed the two girls into a room. Rose and Susan fell onto the floor as he closed the door. Susan and Rose stood up and saw an old man in the room who looked just like Lucille, but thirty years older. Dad, I did well today. I went to get Rose, but I didn't expect to get another one. She's not bad looking. Lucille walked over to his father, Donald, and looked at the two girls with a smile. That's great. When we get tired of one, we can swap. That's more fun. Donald scratched his chin. Both father and son exchanged lewd looks. At that moment, Donald no longer looks like a respectable businessman. Seeing the father and son pair, Rose and Susan were terrified. They hid in a corner of the room like a couple of frightened mice. Help! Someone save us! Susan shouted at the top of her lungs, followed by Rose. Bitch! Call out again! Lucille impulsively walked in front of the two of them, slapped Rose, and then hit Susan, which stopped them from shouting. Son, why did you hit them? Let them scream! Donald was actually smiling. He sat leisurely on the bed and smoked his cigarette. He looked at the two girls who were both looking back at him with anger and fear. You think that just because you shout for help, someone will save you? If that were the case, I'd just book a room in the city center. Why bother coming all the way out here? Let me tell you, if I opened the door and let others see you shouting in the room, they wouldn't dare do anything. Do you believe me? Donald didn't seem to be worried at all. 
Susan and Rose's hearts sank into despair. Rose's legs went limp, and she almost fainted. Phew, <laughs> Donald chuckled. He looked at Lucille and said, Don't just stand there. Go take a shower. Let's get started. Lucille looked at his father with an evil smile and walked into the bathroom. They could hear him turn on the shower and the sound of water flowing. You all, what are you trying to do? Susan asked with a trembling voice. Huh? Donald revealed a surprised expression and then asked back, Men and women in the same room? What do you think we're doing, playing a board game? Susan's mind went blank as her entire body went limp. Rose's heart was beating fast like it was a countdown for her life. The sound of flowing water stopped. Susan and Rose's hearts missed a beat. Lucille came out while wiping his wet hair with a towel wrapped around his lower body. There were droplets of water on his firm muscles. Donald also started to take off his clothes. No, I beg of you, please don't, Rose cried. She knelt on the ground and begged Lucille, Please let me go. I was wrong before. I won't dare do anything. Let me go. Let us go. Y we can compensate you in another way. This is against the law. Although she knew it wouldn't work, Susan also begged them. Huh. Now that I know you're regretting it, do you remember how you insulted me in front of everyone in the angel bar? I swore in my heart that I would get you back for that humiliation. With that, Lucille threw the towel on the ground and walked over to Rose. Don't, don't! Rose tried to back away while pleading, but a wall was behind her. Lucille grabbed her chin with his right hand. He leaned her forcefully against the wall and breathed in her smell. He inched closer and closer to her face as a trace of an evil smile appeared. Rose closed her eyes in fright. She had become a victim. Just when Donald was about to walk towards Susan, the room phone rang. Ring, 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 ring. Donald glanced at the phone in confusion. He had already told the hotel owner that he was going to be busy that night, so the hotel owner definitely wouldn't call him. Even if they had something to talk to him about, they would have just knocked on the door. Who would be calling now? This phone can only connect with the internal hotel line, he thought. Donald finally walked over to the phone and gently picked it up without saying a word. The other party on the phone spoke. I'm Ken Stokes. No matter what you're doing to Miss Susan, stop now. Episode 118. Ken didn't mention you. Ken, Donald thought and shuddered at the sound of his name. He had naturally heard of Ken before and that he was a reputable person. He also knew that no matter how rich or powerful a person was, they had to be respectful toward Ken. They would not dare to offend him. Donald had always wanted the opportunity to meet Ken, and he was never able to because of his limited status. He never expected that his first communication with Ken would be in this way. Donald was stunned. He swallowed hard. Although it was just a simple sentence, and he couldn't be sure that it was Ken who was on the phone, how many people could directly call a hotel's internal line through an external phone? Donald was also a veteran businessman. How could he not know from the sound of the man's voice whether the other party was playing dumb or not? What is it? Are my words useless? Ken asked in a deep voice. This sentence put Donald on alert. He now completely believed that the other party was Ken. Yes, I will listen to your orders and stop, Donald said in fear. He gave Lucille a look, and he reluctantly let go of Rose. Rose bent over and started to vomit. She felt disgusted by his kiss. Lucille didn't understand his father. Now that their family had decided to move, he did not need to be afraid not even of the president of the merchant union. How could his father give in at the most crucial moment? Did you do anything to them? Ken asked. Sitting beside him, Alex was also paying close attention to what Donald was about to say. Donald was terrified. He glanced at Rose, who was bent over vomiting, and then at his hand, which was shaking while he held the phone. Um, my son... After kissing Rose a few times, another girl 
We didn't touch them, Donald said fearfully. He did not dare to lie to Ken at all. Hearing Donald's words, Ken looked at Alex. A trace of sadness flashed across Alex's face. He signaled Ken to do as he was told. Fine. So long as Miss Susan is fine. I don't care about the other one. You can solve your problem if you want. The car that I sent to the hotel is almost there, so Miss Susan should leave now. If anything happens to her, I'll settle the score with you, Ken said lightly. Rose had said before that even if something happened to her, it would be none of Alex's business. He guessed that her treatment of Lucille was the main reason behind their abduction. Rose had been so cocky when she beat him up in front of everybody at the Angel Bar. She was too arrogant. Alex wanted to take this opportunity to teach her a lesson. Yes, yes, I'll release her now, Donald hurriedly promised. After he said that, he hung up the phone. His forehead was covered in sweat. Dad, who called? Why did you agree to release her? Lucille asked his father with disappointment. He really couldn't think of anyone who could make his father so cowardly. He's someone we can't afford to offend. Listen to me, hurry up and let her go. He might not be afraid of President Chase, but Ken was much more powerful. William could, at most, make it difficult for Donald in New York. But with Ken's power, it was still possible for him to not have anywhere to go in the entire country. What Donald couldn't imagine was the extent of the harm that Ken could cause him. Whether he would see the sunrise the next day was unknown. People we can't afford to offend? Dad, who exactly was it on the phone? Lucille couldn't think of anyone that could make his father so scared. Ken Stokes. You might not know him, but even the wealthiest person would be polite to him. William Chase is nothing compared to him. Donald's mood was now very troubled. Lucille had never heard of Ken before, so it was hard for him to believe that. Yet he had no choice but to believe that Ken was someone his family could not afford to offend no matter what. He looked at Rose with eyes filled with hatred. This time she was going to suffer endless humiliation and no one was coming to save her. What are you looking at? Rose straightened her body and glared at Lucille. When she thought about how he had forcefully kissed her just then, her fury surged. She raised her hand and slapped him in the face. Who the hell do you think you are? You even dared to kiss me. You. Lucille's face was stinging, but he didn't dare to challenge her. If Ken got angry, his family would not be able to bear the consequences of his reaction. What about you? You, shameless father and son, should be sent to jail. Rose looked at Lucille's face in anger. She frowned and kicked him in the crotch. She did not hold back. Ouch! Lucille screamed as he clutched his crotch and fell to the ground in pain. Huff, you deserved it. I'll do it again, she said proudly as she looked at him rolling on the floor. Rose, let's go. Susan felt that what Rose did was too dangerous. What if they became anxious and started to beat them? Rose only wanted to get out of the room. Susan, don't be afraid. Don't you see how scared Donald is? Even if they had twice the courage, they wouldn't dare do anything to us. Rose had seen Donald's attitude change to fear on the phone. This time they were saved by someone more important than William Chase. She wasn't afraid at all. There's also this old man, Rose said. She walked toward Donald aggressively and went to kick him in the crotch, but he grabbed her leg. You, let go, old man, Rose said angrily. Let go, you wish, Donald sneered. Ken had said on the phone that he only cared about Susan's safety. He didn't care about the other girl at all. So if they did what they wanted with Rose, Ken wouldn't vent his anger on them. Let go. Aren't you afraid that you'll get into trouble with Mr. Stokes? Rose said shyly as Donald grabbed her foot. Heh. <laughs> Mr. Stokes only told us to let Miss Susan go. He doesn't care about you, Donald said. Hearing those words... Rose's face turned green. Really? Lucille got up from the ground and looked at his father in surprise. He walked to Rose's side and grabbed her wrist with one hand while sneering. 
Stinky bitch, you were pretty cocky just now. Show me your arrogance one more time. Rose was frightened half to death when she saw the father and son pair. She looked at Susan and said, Susan, save me, save me. Please let her go. Please don't hurt her. Susan pleaded with them. Don't meddle in our business. You should leave now, quickly. Donald said politely to Susan, but she looked terrified. She was afraid that if she continued to stay, Donald and Lucille would change their minds and grab her too. She wanted to save Rose, but she could not do anything. So she ran out of the room in fear to go asking the police for help. She rushed out of the hotel in a fluster. It was at that moment that the Maserati Levant that had picked up Alex stopped in front of her. Ah! Susan jumped when the Maserati stopped. She calmed down when a young man stepped out of the car and told her that Ken had sent them to pick her up. I'm begging you, please save my friend. She's in there right now, and she might get beaten up. I'm begging you, please save her. Susan urgently pleaded to the young man. Uh, we were ordered to only ensure your safety. The young man appeared to be in a difficult position. I'm begging you, just help her. Susan fell to her knees with tears flowing from her eyes. Please get up, I can't take it. The young man bent down to help Susan up, but she refused. He had no choice but to agree to her request. All right, let's go save her, he said to another man in the car. Thank you, thank you. While Susan thanked him, another young man stepped out of the car and they ran toward the hotel. Donald and Lucille had Rose pinned down onto the bed. Donald was holding her arms while Lucille was grabbing the collar of her top with an evil glint in his eyes. He pulled it down forcefully, exposing her shoulder. Rose struggled in despair. How can I defend myself from two grown men? She thought as she closed her eyes and burst into tears. The two strong young men broke into the room, kicked Donald and Lucille onto the ground, and pulled Rose up from the bed. It was as though she had been given a new chance at life. She didn't dare to brainlessly insult the father and son now. The two young men supported her by the arms and whisked her out of the room. Rose, are you all right? Seeing that Rose had been saved, Susan rushed over to comfort her. The two girls held each other until Rose gradually calmed down and stopped shaking. Ladies, please get into the car now. We'll take you back, a young man said respectfully. Oh, sorry to keep you waiting. Susan and Rose climbed into the car, and their attention gradually shifted to the expensive Maserati they were sitting in. This was the first time they had ridden in such a luxurious car. May I ask why Mr. Stokes wants to save me? Susan asked the young man sitting across from her. She was curious. As she had never seen Ken before, why would he protect her? Oh, Mr. Stokes is involved because of our boss. The man sitting opposite them was about to say more, but the man sitting in the front passenger seat coughed, turned his head to the side and said with a frown, That's all you need to know. Boss? Susan and Rose were both curious. They continued to ask, Who is your boss? Do you know who we are? What's his name? You don't need to ask those questions. Our task was to ensure that the two of you return safely. As for the rest, we don't know anything. The young man gritted his teeth and did not dare to reveal any more information. Susan and Rose exchanged a glance. They both had a strange feeling. What's this? Susan's hand had carelessly brushed past the seat. She felt something. When she picked up the objects, she saw that it was a pair of woven bracelets. She looked at Rose in surprise and whispered, Rose, aren't these the bands that the old lady gave you and Alex at the night market? Episode 119, Doubts, Bracelets, and Drinks No, no. Rose thought about the night market where the old lady had mistaken her and Alex for a couple. Even though she saw that the bracelets were the ones from the old lady, she didn't want to admit it. Yes, they are. Susan pulled over Rose's hand and slid one of them onto her wrist. Look. Rose glanced at the bracelet on her wrist, but she was still unwilling to admit it. Sir, may I ask how these two bracelets got in the car? 
Susan asked a young man while holding the bands. I don't know. The young man snatched the bracelets from her hands. He could tell from Susan and Rose's conversation that the bracelets belonged to their boss and must have been accidentally dropped by him earlier. Since they belonged to their boss, they had to take good care of his belongings. The young man was in such a hurry that he scratched Susan's hand. She suspiciously looked at him nervously, putting away the bracelets. They must belong to Alex. Why is he so nervous? Could it be... She thought as her eyes moved slightly. Rose, we were lucky to have Mr. Stokes to help us this time, or else we would be in serious trouble. I really misjudged Alex. He was supposed to protect us, but it's really just as you said. He doesn't do anything. He runs away faster than anyone else. The expression on the face of the young man sitting in front of Susan changed drastically. I told you he's not reliable. Rose hated Alex. She went on about how Joe had told him to protect her, but he was nowhere to be found when she was in trouble. Rose hated Alex even more when she thought about how they had been kidnapped by Donald and Lucille. The young man turned his head to look outside the window. He did not want to hear any more of their conversation. Rose, the old lady even treated you two as a couple. Tell me the truth, what do you think of Alex? While Susan said this to her, she secretly observed the young man's reaction. Susan, why are you asking me this? Rose asked. Rose was ashamed. She held Susan's hand, and when she thought of Alex, she was filled with anger. He rushed into the Metro Skybank one day, crashed into me and hit me on the head. When my family is in trouble, he doesn't really try to help. He only says, as an aside, that my problems will definitely be solved. To put it harshly, even beggars are better than him. The young man quickly turned his head and shot a cold glare at Rose. His fist also tightened slightly. What's wrong? Rose asked the young man anxiously, but he didn't say anything. Susan, tell me, why would any normal girl be attracted to scum like Alex? Rose continued, but Susan interrupted her and changed the topic. Soon the car arrived at Preston University. Susan and Rose thanked the young men and expressed their gratitude to Mr. Stokes. They watched the car drive off into the distance before returning to campus. If it wasn't for Alex, we definitely wouldn't be so unlucky today. Rose looked at her torn clothes. Since she was no longer in any danger, she fell into her habit of blaming Alex. Susan had been thinking about something else, but when she heard Rose complain about him again, she couldn't help but pout. Rose, you're impossible, Susan sighed. Did you not notice anything just now? Notice what? Rose was quite puzzled. Are you talking about that Maserati? It really was comfortable. I'll get my future husband to buy one for me. That's not it. Susan was rendered a bit speechless by her attitude. She touched her forehead and said, Don't you think it's strange that the two bracelets were in the car? What's so strange about that? She didn't want to hear anything further about the bracelets. Rose became angry when she thought about Alex's shameless behavior when the old lady put the bracelets on them. Didn't you notice that when we mentioned Alex, the young men were deliberately avoiding us? Rose thought back to what Susan had said in the car and realized what she meant. She looked at Susan, who continued, When we were speaking ill of Alex, the young man sitting in the front of us was obviously unhappy. Do you remember that I had asked him about their boss who had ordered them to save us? The young man almost said something. You mean... Rose understood what Susan was trying to explain, but she quickly rejected that idea. How could this be possible? Don't blindly guess. How could Alex be their boss? He's just a loser with no sense of responsibility. Rose, stop lying to yourself. I know you must be suspecting something in your heart. Susan saw her disgusted expression and guessed what she was thinking. Actually, I also have a lot of doubts. Alex is obviously just an ordinary student. How could he be somebody's boss and also be a big shot like Ken Stokes? Susan paused to think for a while and said, But if it's true, he'll definitely be exposed. We'll observe him a bit more. 
and I believe we'll soon find out his true identity. Okay. Rose saw Susan's questioning gaze directed at her, so she could only nod. She was filled with suspicion and didn't want to believe that Alex had another identity. They walked toward the girls' dorm together. The Maserati drove back to Ken Stokes' location, and the young men entered his office. Alex and Ken were waiting for them. They had already heard the report over the phone that Rose and Susan were safely back at the university. Well done. Alex walked up to the men and patted them on their shoulders. Ken, who was behind them, also gave a satisfied smile. Sir, you're too kind. We're lucky to work for you. One of the young men respectfully said to Alex. He then took out the two bracelets from his pocket and placed them in front of Alex. Sir, you lost these in the car. We kept them for you. Good, okay. Alex saw the bracelets and felt his empty pocket. Then he understood and smiled calmly as he held them. Mr. Stokes, please take care of the things I've told you. It's getting late, so I'll be leaving now. Alex said while looking at Ken. He was referring to the search for Debbie. Yes, I'll do my best to search for you. Rest assured, I'll send for a car to take you back. Ken said respectfully and stood up. Alex had already walked toward the door and said leisurely, No need, I'll go back by myself. He hailed a taxi on the street. After the torment caused by Lucille, it was already 10 o'clock at night. Alex wanted to go back to the villa to rest. His phone rang and a name appeared on the screen. Angel Bar, June Douglas. Alex was surprised to see that the Angel Bar's manager was calling him, but he answered. Where are you? It's great that you have time to come to the bar to help. You've never once stopped by. Do you have the time now? Come to the bar and help me. June's annoyed voice came over the phone. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been too busy with my studies. I can't tonight. I'll go now. Alex thought that the angel bar might be busy, so that's why June had called him to help. He had become a waiter at the bar without intending to and had promised to help when he had the time. He had no reason to refuse. All right, hurry up, exclaimed June with annoyance. Alex hung up the phone and got the driver to take him to the angel bar. Soon, Alex arrived at the bar. It was as he had imagined. It was filled with people, likely due to graduation. Even walking into the bar was a bit difficult. June, I'm here. Alex finally found her, as she was busy toasting with the guests. He shouted at her so she could hear him over the noise. Don't just stand there. Ask the supervisor for a set of clothes. Hurry up and greet the guests. June instructed loudly and then walked over to toast another guest. After Alex changed his clothes, he got busy with work. He was responsible for delivering drinks and snacks and for sending off the customers. Most of the guests were students, so they quickly left after midnight. When the last person departed shortly before one in the morning, everyone finally felt relieved. Everybody, start cleaning up and don't be in such a hurry to leave. The boss wants to come over and see us all. We won't delay you for too long. All right, let's get started. June said to the staff. Alex didn't stay idle either. He checked to see if the power supply for the ice machine and other electrical appliances were in order. When everyone was done, ten or so young staff members gathered and chatted while rubbing their aching legs. The sound of high heels hitting the pavement came from outside, followed by an alluring figure that walked into the bar. She exuded the charisma of a mature woman. Her walk alone was enough to make one's imagination run wild. It was the owner of the Angel Bar, Vivian Carter. When they saw their boss had entered, the staff all stood up from their chairs to show their respect. Vivian waved her hands amiably and said, Everyone sit down. We're all family. No need for formalities. June, give everyone a margarita. Okay, June waved at Alex and another waiter and said, You two, go pour some drinks. They both went to the bar to pour margaritas. They each filled their trays and walked toward the group. Everyone gazed at Alex, who handled his tray awkwardly and spilled a drink. It's all right, just clean up the spill and then bring a few more drinks over, Vivian said to him casually. Okay, Alex answered and cleaned up as she had instructed. He then went to bring out a few more drinks. This time he didn't make any mistakes. Alex found a seat and sat down. He let out a sigh of relief as he looked at Vivian who was sitting gracefully in front of the crowd. 
he felt both grateful and impressed. She had resolved his embarrassment with a simple sentence. Episode 120, Bad Bar Night Vivian, June, and the staff were sitting together having a good time in the bar's relaxed atmosphere. All right, I won't waste any more of your time talking. Let's go home to sleep, Vivian said suddenly with a serious expression. I've already made an agreement to sell this place to someone from the city. In a few days, he'll take over the bar, Vivian said to everyone with a calm smile. But her news was so shocking that it caused a commotion among the staff. Vivian, we won't let the new boss in, one of them cried out. Don't sell the angel bar, don't, said another. Right, if the new boss dares to come in, I'll beat him up and throw him out, said yet another. They had a mixture of sad and excited looks on their faces. Vivian and June had treated them well at the angel bar. Hearing that it had already been sold, they felt as if their home was gone. Alex was also very shocked. He had thought about buying the bar before, but too many things had happened recently, and he had forgotten about it. He didn't expect Vivian to move so quickly. She had already discussed it with someone else. Stop screaming. Do you think Vivian is happy to sell the bar? She probably feels worse than you guys, June told the agitated staff. Vivian had been discussing the sale of the bar with her, so she understood how hard it had been for her to make this decision. June was interrupted by Vivian. She could understand the feelings of her young staff. I know that everyone is reluctant to part with the bar. I still remember when I interviewed each of you. I even promised you on the night before the opening that I would give you all a promotion and a raise sometime after three years. Vivian recalled the scenes from her past. Tears welled up in her eyes, and her voice became choked with sobs. But I didn't fulfill my promise to you all. It's, it's my fault. I'm sorry, everyone. Vivian bowed deeply to her young staff. I don't blame you, said one. Vivian, please don't be like this, said another. Vivian, we love you, said another. All the youngsters crowded around to comfort her. All right, thank you, everyone, thank you. Vivian was very touched. With tears in her eyes, she looked at the staff around her and said, You guys should think about it for the next few days. If anyone wants to keep working here, tell June and I'll try talking to the new boss. Vivian had found a way out for her staff. It could be said that she had done her best. Yo, I've heard that Angel Bar isn't bad. Hey, looks pretty good. A young man said with a chuckle as a few people walked in from outside. Although he was wearing a baseball cap, a scar that ran from his forehead to the corner of his eye was still visible. Next to him were four cynical-looking men that looked like him, with crooked smiles on their faces. Vivian was obviously a bit fearful when she saw the young man, and her gaze even showed traces of hatred. Alex was also surprised as he recognized the group of men. He remembered that day when they had blocked his path on the street, and he had driven toward them, forcing them to scatter and knocking some of them down. It was that day that he had mysteriously helped Kelly Phillips. Looking carefully at the young man with the baseball cap, Alex guessed that he was Henry Moore, who had been pestering Kelly. At Simon Phillips' birthday party, Simon had mentioned that Henry had been looking for revenge. Alex couldn't help but hide in the crowd, but his eyes were still fixed on Henry, observing his every move. I'm sorry, we've closed for the night. Please come back tomorrow, a supervisor politely said with a smile as he walked over to Henry and the others. Hey, the customer has already come in, so I chase him out. I think you need to stop working here. You obviously haven't got enough brains for the job. Henry barely looked at the supervisor. Instead, he and a few of his lackeys sat down with a grunt. Henry glanced at the supervisor in disdain and then turned his gaze to Vivian. When Henry and the others sat down, the staff realized that someone had been standing behind them. This person looked extremely thin and weak, and had been hidden by Henry's group. What was even more surprising was that he wore a white mask on his face, making him look like a mannequin. You! The supervisor had some status in the bar, so he was quite miffed after being scolded by Henry in front of so many people. Oliver, shut up! Vivian shouted. 
Vivian, it's fine if you don't entertain such a person. I'll kick him out right now, Oliver said to Vivian in embarrassment and anger. As Oliver turned toward Vivian and spoke, Henry struck him on the back of the head. When he was about to turn around and retaliate, Henry grabbed him by the hair and kicked him right in the stomach, causing him to fall to the ground. He felt as if his insides were about to explode. All of this happened in an instant. When the people in the bar saw that Oliver was being beaten up by Henry, they all stood up abruptly and rushed over to save him. The four lackeys on Henry's side stood up as well. They squared their jaws, acting like thugs as they pointed at the excited crowd, scaring them. Sit down, shouted one lackey. Let's see who dares to move, shouted another. Only the little masked man was standing firmly behind Henry. These people had strange hairstyles, gold chains, silver rings, and a ferocious look on their faces, causing the young men to lose some of their courage. Sit down, Vivian said with a frown to her staff in a low voice. Everyone was still unwilling to accept it but they finally sat down after she said it again. They cast their resentful gazes toward Henry and the others. Vivian took a deep breath and turned to Henry. Henry, please let him go. Vivian was very reluctant to talk to him as she didn't even know him. A few days ago, he had introduced himself to her and invited her out to dinner. He also invited her to a movie. How could Vivian not see his intentions? However, Henry still followed her around She understood that he was also from a wealthy and powerful family, so she was helpless to do anything. Release him? He just wanted to attack me. How can I, Henry, lose face in front of my friends? Henry said in amusement. His foot ground down on Oliver's face twice. Oliver let out cries of pain. The young men in the bar shuddered slightly, feeling extremely anxious. Vivian's frown deepened as she tried to think of a way to save the supervisor. What do you want to do? Vivian stared at Henry and asked. She was very nervous. It seemed that Henry had come with ulterior motives that day. (laughs) He casually took out his nail clippers and said lightly, It's very simple. I came to the bar for a drink. As long as I can have my drink, I'll leave. As for this thing under my feet, it's not even worth a dime as I see it. Hope you are enjoying our Insta Millionaire story. Download the Pocket FM app for more stories. Link in description. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to never miss our new stories. Henry rolled Oliver's head under his foot as though it were a watermelon. Bring them a drink, Vivian said to the staff at the bar. The waiters glared at Henry and his companions and were about to go to the bar to serve the drinks. Wait a minute, Vivian. My friends and I are here to cheer you on but we won't be able to enjoy ourselves if a few pretty boys serve us drinks. It's not like you don't have any girls in here, so let the pretty girls serve the drinks. Then your guests will be better entertained. Henry looked at his fingernails under the light. Everyone, including Vivian, let out a dissatisfied sigh. However, if they wanted to send this evil guy away, they could only do as he wanted. Girls, come with me to get some drinks to entertain our guests. Vivian ordered four girls to go to the bar. Each of them held a glass as they walked toward Henry and the others. Seeing Vivian and the four girls walk toward them, an evil glint appeared in Henry's eyes. Scram, Henry kicked Oliver's head away. Henry, please. Vivian presented him with a drink. Watching him staring at her, she was both nervous and disgusted. She just wanted him to leave quickly. Fine, I'll drink. How can I dare let Vivian down? His gaze never left her face as his hand slowly reached out toward the glass. The moment he was about to grab it, he grabbed her hand instead. She shook violently, causing the glass to fall and shatter on the ground, while he tightly grasped her hand. Henry's four lackeys also grabbed the girls who were passing them drinks. The girls screamed out in shock at the same time. Let me go, what are you doing? Ah! Vivian screamed in terror. She felt her balance slip as she fell into someone's arms. What am I doing? What can I do? He looked down at Vivian's beautiful face. He was already unable to endure his feelings for her. With her body leaning against him, he could feel her curves. Henry acted like a man who had seen a woman for the first time.